Hi, in this video, we are going to continue on the topic patterns in the chemical world and we will move on to the transition metal. Now, first of all, uh, transition metal, if you look at the periodic table, it is a large group of elements sandwiched between group 2 and group 3. And they are separated because they have some special chemistry of which we are going to talk about it. Um, but first of all, we need to know the definition of transition metal. Uh, so over here, transition metal are metals that can exhibit two or more oxidation states in compound. In compound. Now, pay extra attention to uh, the last two words, in compounds. Um, so what we're trying to say is, uh, for example, if we have sodium, okay? So sodium, you know, by element, you know it has an oxidation number of zero. And you know that it is uh, very likely to form Na plus by losing that um, outermost shell electron. And this one is positive one, right, in terms of oxidation number. So uh, if you're simply looking at sodium, then you will say, wow, it has two oxidation states, right? Uh, it should not have any other uh, oxidation state. It will either be zero or positive one, right? Now, so is it considered as a transition metal? because you see uh, two or more, so two oxidation states. Now, the thing is, sodium is not a transition metal, judging from um, the position. Well, it does not locate it here, right? Um, but according to the definition, why sodium is not considered as a transition metal? Because um, in compounds, we want to talk about oxidation states in compound, okay? Sodium, element, it is not a compound, it is an element. So we do not consider zero as the oxidation state uh, exhibited in a compound, okay? However, other examples which you have learned, for example, Fe, okay? So you know Fe is able to form Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus, right? You have learned it in form four, I guess. So obviously this is positive two, this is positive three. And these are the two possible oxidation states uh, existing in a compound. So you, you can have iron 2 oxide, can have iron 3 oxide, right? So in this situation, it fulfills the definition and therefore iron actually uh, falls within the category of transition metals, okay? So uh, that's why when you are asked to define transition metal, bear in mind you have to mention in compounds, not just say uh, exhibit two or more oxygen state. Otherwise, sodium will be also classified as transition metal. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> in our syllabus, we will mainly focus on the period four uh, transition metal, which is starting from um, scandium to zinc. All right? Um, actually, later we will talk about it. Uh, zinc is not classified as a transition metal, but we'll talk about it later. Okay? So basically, uh, starting from scandium to copper, these are transition metal. And these are basically what we focus on in our um, syllabus, okay? So we call it the first transition series, right? First transition series. Okay, so first of all, uh, we need to know some features or some characteristics about transition metals. So on the right-hand side, these are all the uh, electronic arrangements shown, uh, starting from calcium to um, um, the garium here, okay? Um, of course, we are focusing on the transition metal, which is these one, okay, these things, okay? Right, you may also consider same, but uh, you know, like I said, it's not a transition metal. Um, you noticed they all have sort of the same number of outermost shell electron, except chromium and copper. They are, they are special case, but um, we don't really talk about these two special case. Um, but in general, they have uh, almost the same number of outermost shell electron. So in fact, you know that the, num the, the, the outermost shell electron kind of determine the chemical properties of an element. So in general, we say that transition metal, they have similar chemical properties, similar chemical properties, okay? Um, you notice the addition electron, the additional electrons are added on the third shell rather than the fourth shell, starting from the scandium, right? You see, 9, 10, 11, okay? They are added at the, at the third shell. So the additional electron does not 
added to the outermost shell, and that's why they have very similar chemical properties. All right, so here, transition metal have either one or two outermost shell electrons. Electrons are added to the inner shell rather than the outer shell. So actually, they have similar chemical properties. Okay? Um, I, I understand you may, you may want to ask why. Why is that? Um, the explanation is in university level before it's in A level. Uh, at this point, uh, I think you can simply accept it. Okay? Uh, just you know, memorize it. Okay, this is like the fact you need to recognize. Okay, now the second point about transition metal is they are having very high melting point. Actually, we don't really talk about boiling point because all of them are metals; they are solid. Okay, so they have very high melting point. Um, the reason is because first of all, they are all having giant metallic structure; they are all metals. Um, <coughs> we, and we also say that the electrons. If you look at um, the outermost shell electrons, you may say, well, only one or two, right? So probably they will uh, have two uh, delocalized electrons contributing to the uh, giant metallic structure. But in fact, it's, it turns out that the, the third shell, the third shell, can also be contributed to the sea of delocalized electrons and therefore strengthening the uh, metallic bond. So, that's why uh, for transition metal in general, they have very high melting point. We are talking about over 1,000 degrees Celsius as the melting point. So um, this is something you need to recognize. Now, three very important properties, basically for uh, this topic, uh, patterns in the chemical world. Uh, very often they ask about these three properties. So the whole topic, this is the main cause of the whole topic, okay? Now, these are the three general properties of transition metals. So, colored ions, variable oxidation state, and catalytic properties. <clears throat> now, first of all, colored ions. You notice that for these transition metals, when they form ions in aqueous state, they will have different colors. So, these are some examples. Actually, a lot of you, you, you guys already come across uh, in the previous topic. Um, so, some of them that worth mentioning is um, perhaps chromium, uh, you know, chromium, usually we see uh, uh, chromium-3 ion and also the dichromic ion, right? Usually it's a very common oxidizing agent. Uh, this one is, the, is yellow in color when um, it is not acidified. It. When it is not acidified, it, it kind of have a yellow color, okay? Uh, manganese, manganese-3 ion is red in color. Um, two plus and permanganate ion you guys are very familiar with. Um, nickel is green in color. Cobalt is pink, okay? Uh, this is the reason why you have dry cobalt-2 chloride paper. When it comes across with water, it turns pink because cobalt-2 plus aqueous ion is pink in color. <coughs> um, Titanium-3 plus is purple in color. Vanadium-2 plus, 3 plus is green, uh, is, is violet and green respectively, okay? So uh, better recognize some of these colors. Um, the second point we need to know, which is very important, which is the variable oxidation state. Um, for transition metal, according to the definition, you know, they are defined as having two or more oxidation states in their compounds. So this table kind of lists out all the uh, possible oxidation states from, uh, I mean, all the possible oxidation states we can observe from the compound of these transition metals. Uh, you notice that uh, most of them are having two or more possible uh, oxidation states in their compounds. And those that I have underlined it and bolded are those that are exceptionally stable and therefore commonly observed. Commonly observed. Um, you notice that for most of the uh, transition metal, they exhibit a plus two uh, oxidation state uh, simply because you see, most of them are having two electrons in the outermost shell. So by losing the two outermost shell electrons, they will have a, have a, they, they will be relatively stable, okay? And you know that two electrons should be easiest to be removed because they are at the, at the outermost shell. So therefore, you see most of them are having a positive two oxidation state. Um, some of them got positive three, uh, some of them got positive four. <coughs> um, there's also one thing uh, that probably uh, able to uh, allow you to predict is that the maximum, the highest oxidation state. Um, you realize that if you look at the calcium, okay, calcium is um, 2882, right? 
So uh, calcium will form calcium 2 plus because by losing that two electrons, it will have 288, which is octet rule. Now, uh, you, you notice that octet rule does not really apply to here, uh, but you know, the idea is if you can achieve octet structure, um, that is stable. So if there is a chance that an element can have an octet structure, it will, it will, it will go ahead. It will, it will um, likely, it is more than welcome to attain an octet structure. So thinking about this, now try to follow here. So if calcium is forming um, an oxidation number of positive two by losing the two electrons, for scandium, which has one extra electron when coming to calcium, it will be more than welcome to lose three electrons. Because by losing three electrons, then it will become 288, which is octet structure, which is quite stable, right? So scandium will have a tendency to lose three electrons to have an oxidation state of positive three. Okay? Titanium, positive four. Vanadium, positive five. Chromium, positive six. Manganese, positive seven. Okay? So as you can see from here, positive three, positive four, positive five, positive six, positive seven. So, and, and those are the oxidation state that I have bolded and underlined because those are uh, the very stable oxidation state because of the octet structure, okay? So this kind of tells you um, um, <coughs> what are the possible oxidation states. And that also gives you an idea that, for example, if you ask, oh, is it possible for vanadium to have a positive six oxidation state? The answer is no, because if you look at the um, <coughs> electronic arrangement, if you go back to vanadium, okay, so the maximum oxidation state is positive five because by losing two electrons from the outermost shell and losing five, so think about it, okay, let's just say I put it here. If they lose five electrons, then it will become 288, right? Minus two here, minus three here. And this is octet structure, right? Octet structure, very stable. So if, it's, if it wants to have a positive six oxidation state, what it's gonna do is to remove an electron from um, the, the, the octet structure, which is unstable, right? <coughs> so this is the reason why for vanadium, the highest oxidation state is positive five. It can never get positive six, right? So this kind of tells you um, what the possible oxidation number. So by knowing the atomic number, you know um, the maximum oxidation number for vanadium is positive five, okay? Now, what about uh, Fe? Now, uh, you know, the, the story is not perfect. Um, you don't expect to see positive eight, positive nine, positive 10. Um, one of the reasons is because uh, having such a high oxidation number is not stable. Um, there's actually another reason, but that one is out of the syllabus. So, um, you know, the, the story that, that I just told you only applied to the first half of the first transition series, okay? Um, starting from Fe, they, they kind of, you know, have a different oxidation number. But you stick with the positive two. You stick with the positive two rules, then it should be fine. Um, copper, uh, it can be positive one. Pay extra attention on that. And, um, and you notice zinc has only one uh, possible oxidation number for, for zinc. So actually this is one of the reasons why zinc does not classify as a transition metal because zinc can only be uh, t uh, plus two. Okay, it has only one possible oxidation state in a compound. So that's why zinc does not consider it as a transition metal. Okay. All right, down here, these are some uh, common examples. Actually, we, can we have already talked about it when we talk about redox reaction. These are some common oxidation, uh, oxidizing agent or reducing agent. Um, you realize that because um, transition metal, they can have variable oxidation state. Therefore, they are they are able to have compound acting as a reducing agent. They can have compound acting as an oxidizing agent. Again, reducing agent is an agent that undergoes oxidation, right? So Fe2 plus is able to form positive three, right? That means it is eligible to undergo oxidation. Therefore, it can act as a reducing agent. Plus the fact that positive three is a very stable oxidation state. So Actually, Fe2 plus have a high tendency to be oxidized into positive three, Fe3 plus. Therefore, it acts as a good reducing agent. Similar idea for iron three plus. 
it can be an oxidizing agent because um, it can be reduced to Fe2+, which is also a very stable oxidation state. So that's why it can act, so iron compound or compound of transition metal can actually act as reducing agents and oxidizing agents, okay? Uh, manganese is another example. Uh, so manganese, uh, MnO2, uh, we learn about it when we talk about the um, same carbon cell, right? Because same carbon cell uh, has the MnO2 acting as the oxidizing agent to um, oxidize any uh, hydrogen form during the reaction, if you remember. So MnO2 is a, is a good oxidizing agent. Uh, this is an example, and it is also be used to prepare uh, actually uh, chlorine gas, chlorine gas by reacting MnO2 with Cornish Cl. Okay, it's a very handy reaction to create some chlorine gas. Okay, so MnO2 is a good oxidizing agent. MnO4 minus, of course, you guys learn about it. It's a very good oxidizing agent. Okay, so that's the idea about. Um, some example of transition metal compound that can act as an oxidizing agent or reducing agent. Okay, the key is the key is they can exhibit variable oxidation state, so they are able to change the oxidation state from plus two, plus three, etc., um, st and still being stable. Okay, um, for uh, group one, group two, group three metals, they cannot because. Uh, their elemental forms are unstable, and they only got one oxidation state, which is stable, right? So they cannot kind of move between positive two, positive three, etc. They, they cannot. So like this is something that is distinctive for transition metal, okay? Now, there's a practice question over here. Again, pause the video, try to do it yourself first before looking at my uh, explanation, All right? Um, so the first one, manganese four oxide can be acted as an oxidizing agent, reduce agent, explain why, okay? So the reason is because um, manganese can exist, sorry, okay, can exist as, as, or it can have stable oxidation state of positive 2 and positive 7, okay? So, Mn, okay, O2 can be reduced to Mn2+, plus, okay? Thus, acting as an OA. And also, MnO2, can be oxidized to MnO4 minus, thus acting as an RA, okay? So, to, ex to answer this question, first of all, we have to point out that uh, manganese is a transition metal. It is able to have variable oxidation states, and in this particular situation, Mn is able to exi exhibit uh, positive 2, positive 7, being also stable oxidation state. Um, you can refer to um, here, so uh, positive 4, positive 7, but you, you know by our experience, we know Mn2 plus is also uh, an oxidation state that can exist, so positive 2. Actually, Mn can have various oxidation states, but what I'm trying to point out is something that is more um, commonly seen. Okay, so positive 2, positive 4, positive 7 is what, what I'm going to explain. So to explain they can act as an oxidizing agent, that means you need to tell people that it can be reduced. Okay, so MnO2 can be reduced to Mn2+, plus, uh, or you can say Mn2O3, which is having a positive 3 oxidation state. Uh, if it can be reduced, then it can act as an oxidizing agent, right? Uh, similar idea go for MnO2. It can be oxidized to MnO4 minus and therefore acting as a reducing agent. Okay. Now, two reasons why zinc is not considered as a transition metal. Um, so to explain this one, this is a very common question, you have to look at the general property of transition metal and also the definition. Okay. 
Now let's look at the, the, the definition, the first definition. Um, a transition metal has to have a variable oxidation states in compound, okay? So you can say only, okay, one um, oxidation state in compound, okay? Because we need two, right? Which is positive two, okay? And also, it does not, doesn't form, okay, colored ions other than aqueous ions, okay? This is also a feature of transition metal. It forms uh, colored than aqueous ions. But sin 2 plus is colorless, if you remember. Okay, and this is the only aqueous ion it can form. So this is the reason why it is not uh, considered as a transition metal. Now here, uh, it can be positive 2, positive 3, positive 4, which of the following statement is true, uh, are true. Now titanium ion is purple in color. If you memorize the color correctly, this is a correct statement. Um, titanium 2 sulfide can be acting as a reducing agent. So reducing agent will undergo oxidation, right? It wants to undergo oxidation. So it is positive 2. Can it undergo oxidation? Of course it can. Of course it can because it can go to positive 3 and positive 4, right? So of course it is okay. Now titanium 4 fluoride can be acting as a reducing agent. This one is not. Because again, acting as a reducing agent, it has to undergo oxidation, but it already attained its highest possible oxidation number. It cannot go to positive 5, cannot go to positive 6, so it cannot act as a reducing agent. It can only act as an oxidizing agent. Okay? So this is not correct. The answer is A. Right? Now, the last property, which is the catalytic property, which are even more important. Um, so first of all, we refresh your memory about catalyst. Catalyst is a substance that can alter the reaction rate by providing alternative pathway with lower activation energy. Um, now this one we haven't really talked about it. Uh, it should be in the, in the elective part, but basically it can alter the reaction rate, okay, without undergo permanent chemical changes, right? This is what we have learned um, before in the, the rate of reaction, okay, without undergo permanent chemical change. Now pay extra attention to um, the word permanent chemical change. So does it mean that it never undergoes chemical change? The answer is no. It will undergo chemical change, but it is not permanent. That means um, during the reaction, it may undergo some chemical change, but at the end of the reaction, the catalyst will be regenerated, or some kind of reaction will convert the compound back to its original um, state. So that's why they will not undergo permanent chemical change. But bear in mind, it may undergo chemical change during the reaction, but probably it is regenerated at the end. This is what it is shown here. It may participate in the reaction, undergo some chemical changes, but at the end, it should be regenerated. So overall, it is not being consumed. Okay? Um, the reason why transition metal can act as a catalyst is because it has a variable oxidation state. So it can transverse from like positive 2 to positive 3 to positive 4, etc. It can change. So by having this ability of having different oxidation states, it can actually act as a electron carriers. Electron carriers. So thinking about the whole redox concept is actually the transfer of electrons, right? So if you are able to change, let's just say I have Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus, okay? If you can change from, you can, if you can swap between the two oxidation states easily, then you think about it. If you swapped from positive two to positive three, okay? What you are doing is you are losing electrons, okay? And if you go back, you're gaining electrons, right? So you can think about it as an electron carrier. So um, if you're starting from Fe3+, plus, you can carry an electron on itself and then change it to Fe2+, plus, okay? Now, so Fe2+, plus will, will, will be carrying an electron. And when Fe2+, plus wants to... Uh, 
release that electron to some others, then it will simply go back to Fe3+. So this one kind of acting as an electron carrier. Okay. Now we will look at two examples, how transition metal uh, ions can act as an electron carrier. Now the first example is the reaction between iodine and this peroxyl disulfate ion, S2OH2-. Now first of all, let's look at the oxidation state. For iodine ion, it is obviously negative one. Um, this one is zero, so you can tell um, iodine ion is oxidized, it, and this one should be reduced. Okay. Now this one, if you look at the oxidation number, which is probably quite challenging, so this is uh, negative 16, and this should be positive um, seven, right? Okay. Each sulfur each is uh, positive seven. Now over here, this one should be positive six, right? Okay. So in other words, the iodine ion uh, basically transfer electrons to the uh, S2OH2 minus, right? This is basically the reaction, right? The iodine ion transfer its electron to um, the S2OH2 minus. Okay. So, however, the direct transfer is very slow. The reaction is very slow because you look at iodine ion is negatively charged. This one is negatively charged too. And you know a reaction must be brought about by collision, right? So you don't expect these two to collide very effectively, simply because the negative charges repel each other, okay? So it involves collision of the two reactants of the same charge. So the reaction is very slow. Now how can we speed it up? Well, we speed it up by adding something that can facilitate the electron transfer. And to do that, we try to use Fe2 plus or Fe3 plus, okay? It doesn't matter which one. It doesn't matter which one. So, for example, uh, if you add Fe2 plus, now again, Fe2 plus can convert into Fe3 plus by losing the electrons. So, Fe2 plus is a guy that can provide electrons. It can provide electrons, okay? So, if you add Fe2 plus, so Fe2 plus by itself already have an electron, it can basically transfer its electron to the S2OH2 minus, okay? And therefore, reducing it into sulfate ion, okay? So they kind of provide electrons to the, self, to the peroxyl sulfate, disulfate ion instead of the I minus, so it, okay, it provides electrons to it. So once it provides electrons to the S2OH2 minus, now it becomes Fe3 plus, all right? Now, Fe3 plus is the one that is uh, lacking electrons. It wants to have an electron. So Fe3 plus is going to visit I minus and grab the electron from the I minus and therefore oxidizing it into I2, okay, and itself becoming Fe2 plus, okay. Now this one I should put a two here, okay. So you realize that after the Fe3 plus have taken the electron from iodine ion, it becomes Fe2 plus, which is the original state, okay. So the whole thing is basically instead of the iodine ion directly transfer electrons to the S2OA2 minus. Um, we have the Fe2 plus to first provide electrons to the S2OX2 minus, and then the Fe3 plus will take the electron from the iodide ion, okay, in order to uh, facilitate the electron transfer. Now, the, this two step reaction will be faster than the one step reaction because you realize that the two reaction involving a positive ion colliding with a negative ion. Okay, which is much, much faster, okay? And if you try to uh, combine the two equations together, you realize that you can uh, eliminate all the uh, iron ions, okay? Because they're not being used up, they're not being consumed, okay? Obviously, we can cancel out each other, <coughs> okay? It involves collision of the two species of opposite charge, okay? Initially consumed and then convert back to Fe2+. Plus. Now, uh, you may ask, can we add Fe3 plus at the first place? The answer is, of course, yes. If you add Fe3 plus at the first place, then it will undergo the second reaction first, and then followed by the first reaction, all right? Actually, it can accomplish the same tasks. Now, the second reaction here, uh, actually, similar idea, similar idea, okay? But it is a little bit special because we, we don't add, we don't actually add a catalyst. The reaction itself, catalyzed itself, 
Okay, this is very interesting. Okay, the reaction itself will catalyze itself. This is something what we call autocatalysis. Autocatalysis. Now let's look at what is going on. So this reaction is between MnO4- and uh, oxalate ion. Same idea goes for here. Um, when the two uh, negatively charged ions collide with each other, um, it is very difficult. Very difficult. Okay, the repulsion. Okay, very difficult. So what it does is, um, as the reaction proceeds at the first place, it is very slow. Okay. However, as the reaction proceeds, it starts to generate some Mn2+. And this Mn2 plus actually acting as a catalyst. Because when the Mn2 plus is formed, Mn2 plus is a reducing agent. So it can actually uh, reduce the MnO4 minus. Reduce the MnO4 minus. Okay? To form Mn3 plus. Now this step is fast because we have a positive reacting with a negative. Okay? So it is faster. Now once you have Mn3 plus, it is a very good oxidizing agent, so it can oxidize the oxalate ion into carbon dioxide and reduce itself back to Mn2+. Okay? So you realize that Mn2+, which is the product of the reaction, actually acting as a catalyst. Okay? And that's why the reaction, if you look at the right hand side here, this is a graph, very strange graph. It is a concentration time graph. Um, you, in general, you expect a graph to be like, like this, right? The graph to be like this, okay? The graph to be like this because usually you start with a higher concentration, the reaction collide more frequently, and therefore have a faster reaction. And at the end, when the concentration of the reactant is low, the uh, chances of collision is lower, and therefore uh, the reaction is lower. This is what you expect to see. But in this case, it is very strange. It start off with a slow reaction. It start with a slow reaction, okay? Because the collision between the negatively charged species are not favorable, okay? But during the middle course of the reaction, the reaction is very fast. You see the steepest slope because the Mn2 plus can act as a catalyst to speed up the reaction. Now at the end, the reaction is slower. Now this one is because even though you got a high concentration of Mn2 plus catalyst, but the reaction is limited by the low concentration of MnO4 minus, and therefore it, it, it gets lower towards the end. But this kind of sigmoid curve, we call it sigmoid curve. Um, it's very special, and this is an example of autocatalysis, which is also asked in the previous class with the questions in form of an assay. Okay, so this is an interesting situation. Okay, so a practice question again, pause it, do it yourself before looking at my explanation. Okay, let's do it. So, three general properties one, colored ions, two, variable oxidation state. And thirdly is the catalytic property. Okay, actually there are two more, but um, it's out of the syllabus, which is uh, being magnetic, and also um, and also um, the other one I forgot, but the other one is being magnetic because of some reason. Okay. Okay, uh, the reaction between aldehyde ions and this one use elemental aldehyde. So write a balanced aldehyde equation. Basically, you, you copy the one. Um, at the previous page, okay, S two O eight two minus to form iodine and two S O four two minus. Okay, why is it very slow? Because it involves coalition of, okay, likely charged, okay, ions such that I minus N S two O eight two minus. Okay, not favorable due to repulsion, okay? So uh, how copper 2 plus can speed up the reaction? So first of all, uh, copper 2 plus, okay, can first react with, so in, first you have to know, copper 2 plus, it can be um, plus and 2 plus, right? Okay, so the 2 plus here can be reduced it to add to, to Cu plus, and therefore it is a good oxidizing agent. So it can actually oxidize I minus, okay, to form Cu plus and I2, okay? Then the Cu plus uh, reacts with 
S2OH too much to form okay the Cu2 plus and the sulfate ion okay so this is a good reducing agent okay so you realize that um, both reactions are fast because okay oppositely charged ions okay uh, colliding okay which is favorable okay which is favorable all right so um, this is how you explain okay good so the next page um, the importance of transition metal uh, so for transition metal the most important thing is acting as a catalyst as a catalyst for uh, industrial process so these are some examples of um, of the uh, catalyst used in the industry um, but besides transition metal they are also uh, because they have a high melting point and uh, they they also have certain properties and able to be used as components in material uh, medicinal application uh, because they some of them they are radioactive uh, isotope that can be used to kill cancer to kill uh, the bad cells maintaining health uh, this one you learn in biology some of the ions are uh, uh, coenzymes okay, which are useful so these are some examples of the uh, catalyst and some of the application that probably you need to learn some of them so read it yourself and uh, that's it for the transition metal and that's it for the video so see you later bye bye